be in the Lord's house. want to get started with some announcements to let you know that there is a volunteer sign-up sheet on the welcome desk. We need people to help register people. We need people to help with parking. We need people to help with ushering. So if you can help at all with that, on that particular day, there is a sign-up sheet out there, and so this is an all-hands-on-deck deal. We need greeters, and, and we, all right, I feel greeted. All right, we got the motorcycle ministry helping with the car parking. We appreciate that. So anyway, make sure that you sign up with that so we know who's doing what, so we got all that covered. As you remember, last year we made sure that ushers were at every door because there will be a lot of people here that don't know the building, so we need to make sure people know which direction to go and what we got going on and get them registered. We're going to have a will call list plus ticket collectors and all that good stuff. So we're looking forward to a great time with that and uh, just a little over a month away. So uh, please keep that in mind. Starting next Wednesday, next Wednesday mor uh, morning at 1130, uh, they'll be having a midweek midday Bible study here at the church. Uh, be meeting in the uh, coffee shop area up front. So anybody that's interested in that, uh, see Brother Jim. He can tell you more about it. He'll be leading that. Uh, let your family or friends know those that may be uh, off during the day and maybe can't make church at night. This is an opportunity for you to come and uh, dig in the Word and learn a little bit and see what God has. Also, our Father's Day breakfast on Father's Day, the 21st of June. Uh, will be at 10 o'clock that morning. There will be no p.m. service that night for Father's Day. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet for the Father's Day breakfast, so if you're interested in uh, allowing the ladies to feed you that morning, and uh, this is open to all men, so please uh, make sure you sign up for that. And then Vacation Bible School starts that next Monday, the 22nd through the 26th. Uh, if, you, if your children are coming, we would ask you to go to the website and register them uh, on the website so that we already have them register. Uh, uh, the Jones girls are the only ones, Brother Major, that we got so far. We, we know we got the Jones girls going to be here for Vacation Bible School. So any other, praise God, any other, uh, John's like, yeah, they are. And Ashley's the one that did it. But it's all right. I, I take credit for it, too. <laughs> but anyway, so register children online if you can do that. If, you, if, if not, we'll have to register them when they come in the door. That just helps us uh, speed up the process of getting the kids registered. Baby bottle blessings for CPC uh, going through the 28th of June. If you've not gotten a baby bottle, if you'd like to help with that, see Sister Sue after service, and uh, she'll be able to tell you more about that. And uh, basically, you take that baby bottle and fill it up with change, and it helps uh, with, the, with some of the things that we got going on at CPC. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to have his way. I uh, do want to say about CPC, sometime this month we're supposed to hear about a grant from Timken uh, to help us uh, go medical. Uh, and, and we proposed for uh, a full purchase amount of uh, uh, Dr. Chang, who was an uh, OBGYN here in Lincolnton. He has offered us his building at tax value with all the contents. That meant ultrasound machines, office equipment, all everything. It's, you walk in, and it's like he's open for business. And he said that he'll, offer, he'll sell it to all of us. He'll sell it all to us at tax value of the building. So we've proposed for a grant from Timken for that purchase amount. And so we're supposed to hear something uh, at, during this month. They, they were supposed to have a meeting at the first of the month. We should know something by the end of the month, uh, what we got or if we got anything. And the cool thing about it is we were the only ones that applied for a grant. So, uh, <laughs> I, you know, the only reason they turned us down is because they don't like what we got. But it, anyway, uh, but they've done a lot of great things for our community. Timpkin Foundation has. And so uh, uh, the, the gentleman that was over it is in our corner and is pushing for it. So hopefully by the end of the month we'll have some great news and a praise report about that. So uh, speaking of praise reports, uh, for, for those of you that may or may not know, little Brantley, uh, Tabitha and Joel's uh, son, uh, has been sick since Sunday. Uh, has been running up to upwards 103, 104 fever uh, e every day and has been having stomach pains, um, has been having stomach pain, stomach disorder that they couldn't even touch his stomach. It was so, uh, it was so sensitive that they couldn't even touch it. And uh, she took him to the hospital last night, and, and there was a picture that was sent, and he just looked so pitiful in on the hospital bed. And so I went up to see him uh, after I called Joel and ringed him out because nobody told me I had to find out secondhand on Instagram. I told him I don't have Instagram, I don't have Facebook. Uh, I do finally have a Twitter, but don't tweet me because I don't know how to work it yet. Uh, but uh, that's how I had to find out. And so I went up there about 10 o'clock last night, Tracy and myself, and when I walked in the door, he sat up and he calls me Pop Paul, and, uh, which is kind of funny, but that's what he calls me because he can't say pastor, so he calls me Pop Paul. And so as soon as I walked in the door, he sat up, Pop Paul, and grabbed this glove that had been blowed up like a balloon, and we commenced to play, and, and the more we played, the, the, the better he got and the better he felt. 
fever broke, pains went away, and she says she's went all day long. No fever, no pain, just normal Brantley. So I thank God for that. And uh, we had prayer with her. I said, can I pray for you? And he, he heard me say pray, and next thing I know, he whacked me in the head and said, in Jesus' name. I was, wait a minute, I want to pray for you. You not pray for me. That's, that's his thing now. You go up to him, he's going to flow it behind you. He's going to hit you in the head and pray for you and say, in Jesus' name. So uh, I thank God that he touched Brantley and ministered to him. And uh, uh, tap, just as I was coming into church, uh, Tabitha sent me uh, 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 the praise report over text. So continue to pray for them and minister, and God will just continue to touch them in a mighty way. Sheila Rutledge has hurt her knee, so please pray for her. And uh, Terry Dornbush uh, is trying to quit smoking, so we're asking God to touch her and minister to her. Tiffany Osborne has continued to recover from her surgery. We got any update? Wow, okay. Yeah, it's, it's expensive. So remember Tiffany, not only for her recovery from this spleen surgery, but also uh, for this cancer situation and her financial situation, uh, that God would touch her and minister to her. Uh, also remember Frank o Oshetsky, uh, who needs a healing. Uh, the doctors have pretty much said that there's nothing that they could do for him, so remember him, if you will. Remember uh, Ginger Weathers, who's in a lot of pain. And my wife has a biopsy in the morning, so please remember her. Uh, that God would touch her and minister her as she goes for this. And, uh, of course, we talked to you about the praise report for Brantley. So uh, we know God's able to do that. Amen? Amen. God's good. God's good. Yes, ma'am. Oh, if you want fresh fresh vegetables, hey, now the, the gardens, are, gardens are coming in. So if you want any vegetables and you don't have a garden, there's some fresh ones out there. Help yourself to it. All right? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Steve Williams. Steve Gregory, colon cancer. Steve Gregory, colon cancer. I'm saying it a couple times so my wife can hear what I'm doing here. She'll put it on the list so we'll make sure we don't forget it. All right. Amen. God's good. Amen. Thank you so much again for coming out. Let's stand and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And I want to ask a couple men to come. We're going to receive our offering. Uh, but, but John, could you help me tonight, bro? I appreciate it. Bro and Jim, y'all can, can be able to work it through the middle there. Y'all can be all good. I know God's, God's able. Let's ask God to have his way as we receive an offering tonight and these requests and praise reports and just see what God has for us. Let's pray together. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to come into your house, God, to receive from you and to receive from your word. God, I thank you for your blessing and all that you do for us. I pray, God, that you would bless and move in every need. God, I want to thank you, first of all, how you touched Brantley, Lord. I, I just glorify your holy name, God. You, you moved in a mighty way, and we bless your name for that tonight, God. You are worthy of all the praise and all the glory. God, I, I just watched that the doctor walked in baffled, saying last night that there seems to be nothing wrong with him. And I, I'm just so thankful for what you have done and what you are doing and how you're demonstrating your power and your presence and your glory and all that you do for us, God. We just give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. And, Father, I ask you tonight that you'd move in every other need and request, God, that you administer them. And just as you touched Brantley, God, you could touch these needs. Doctors are saying they don't know what to do in some of these situations. But, God, we know that you are the great physician, and we lean upon you, and we trust in you, God, that your divine will is going to be accomplished in every life of every need. Father, for these that have been mentioned and even these that may be unmentioned tonight, God, I pray that you administer in a mighty, mighty way. Father, we just thank you again for the opportunity to come tonight to dig into your word and receive from you and to hear what you have to say to us. Bless our youth that is there in class tonight. God, bless those that may be watching online. I pray, God, that you be glorified in all that's done and all that's said. Father, we just surrender it to you. And, Father, bless this time of giving. Use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom. And for everything that's done and accomplished, Father, we'll be sure to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it all. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Come on, let's worship and give him. As they go by, you can be seated. You grab your Bibles, and we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4. Three verses of Scripture tonight. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6.
God's good. Amen? Amen. Anybody love the Lord? Anybody realize I'm stalling? It's because this little thing is not doing what it's supposed to do. There we go. Come on up. Come on up. God's good. All right. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. The Bible said there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So tonight I want to talk to you about the basis of unity. The basis of unity. Father, add your blessing to your word and bless your people, I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. All right, so here we go. We've been talking about unity. We've been talking about over the last few verses, we talked about walking worthy of our calling, what it is to walk worthy as an individual, what it is to walk worthy as a, as a body, as a, as a called minister of God. And we spent a few weeks talking about these first three verses of the, particular, uh, of the fourth uh, chapter particularly, and we went through several different things about that, those uh, different, uh, three different verses there. So I want to get to the, this fourth through the sixth verse tonight and look at the basis of unity. So Paul goes on to set down the basis on which Christian unity is founded, where it is founded, where it lies. Number one, in verse 4, he said, there is one body. One body. One body. The Bible said that Christ is the head and the church is the body. So listen, let's think about it from the perspective of a body, your body, my body, and look at it from that perspective. No brain can work through a body which is split into fragments. You cut your arm off and disconnect it from the opportunity for your brain to give it the signal that it needs to do what it needs to do. That brain, that, that arm will have no function. If your leg is severed, anything that is severed, a fragmented body that is severed away from the body that loses connection with the brain or connection with the head, it, it, it becomes null and void. It, it, it's, it's of no use. It's, it's, it's invalid, if you will. And so there is absolutely no way that a body can work if it is split into fragments. Unless there is a coordinated oneness in the body, the plans and and intentions of the head are very much frustrated. I don't know about you, as I get older, I begin to find that my brain's telling me that my body can do one thing, but my body's saying no. <laughs> I, I thought I'd get an amen right there. My, my brain is telling me I'm still in my 20s, but my body is letting me know very quickly, no, son, you're in your 40s, and you're pressing on. Amen. So, so, so the body and the brain have to work together, and they have to work together in a oneness. There has to be a oneness in order for the body to work. In other words, if the body is trying to do one thing and the head is trying to do another, it brings frustration. So the oneness of the church is essential for the work of Christ. If Christ is the head and he's the brain of the whole operation, then the body has to come into a coordinated oneness with him in order to understand what the purpose is so that we can come together in unity unity, operating under his headship, his lordship, to be everything that God has called us to be. And so there has to be this oneness of the church in order for the work of Christ to go forth. That does not need to be a mechanical oneness of administration or of human organization. In other words, we don't have to administrate it. We don't have to organize it. We don't have to, we don't have to necessarily sit down and make it uh, according to what we want it to be in order to get that oneness. It must be, have, it must be spread by the Spirit of God and by the love of Christ. So it does not need to be that oneness that is just founded on a common love of Christ and of every other part of the for the other. It, it, it does not have to be administrated. It does not have to be humanly organized. It has to be totally reliant on the words of Christ and the works of Christ and what Christ is called to do. And so he says that there's going to be a foundation for unity. You must first understand that there is one body. There's not a Church of God body. There's not a Baptist body. There's not an Episcopalian body. There's not a Presbyterian body. Body, there is one body of Christ. All those who are saved and separated by the blood of Jesus Christ, and their and their blood and their and their sins have been washed, and they've been made whole and new because of what Christ has done. They are effectively and efficiently a part of the body of Christ. We need to begin to understand if the body of Christ, if they're ever going to come together in the way that Jesus determined that we should come together, that we would be one as He and the Father are one. We have got to set aside these titles. We got 
to set aside these tags. We got to set aside these, these labels that we put on one another. Listen, I want people to know, first and foremost, that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Not that I'm an ordained bishop of the church of God. Not that I'm a church of God member. Not, not that I'm a, affiliated with a certain organization. Not, not, not even that I've labeled myself as Pentecostal. I want people to know that I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. That I am a disciple of His. That I am obedient, not only to His command, but to His word and what He has called me to do. That's what the world needs to see from the body of Christ. I'm not Episcopalian. I'm not Presbyterian. I'm not Church of God. I'm not Church of Christ. I'm not any of these labels, but I am one with Jesus Christ, and it doesn't matter what a brother looks like. He can have dark skin, light skin. He can be red head, brown head, blonde. I don't care. We can come together because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because I have come together under the us under the umbrella of the body, one body in Jesus Christ. This is the only place that you can find the, the workings and the, and the effectiveness of the church to be what God has called it to be. So he said there is one body. There's also one spirit. One spirit. The word pneuma in Greek means both spirit and breath. It is, in fact, the usual word for breath. Unless the breath is in the body, the body is dead. But there's only one spirit. There's only one life giver. One breath. Unless the breath is in the body, the body is dead. And the life-giving breath of the body of the church is the Spirit of Christ. It's His Spirit. It's the Holy Ghost. There can be no church without the Spirit. There can be no receiving of the Spirit without prayerful waiting. If you want the one body to operate with the one Spirit, there has to be a connection, and the connection comes through prayerful tarrying. Jesus told his disciples, listen, I want to endure you with power. I want to fill you with the Spirit of God. I want to fill you with, with the Holy Ghost. I want to do this. But you've got to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with this power. There has to be a prayerful tarrying that takes place in the body of Christ to get the one Spirit moving. It is amazing to me how today in modern, with modern technology, with, with all the broadcasting and all the things going on, it is amazing to me how many different things one Spirit is saying. It is absolutely amazing to me how one spirit can have so many different opinions. Or you see where I'm going at. You know, you, you can listen to this broadcast and the Spirit of God is saying this. And you can listen to see see this Facebook post and the Spirit of God is saying this. And you can see this Instagram post and the Spirit of God is saying this. You can listen to this radio program and the Spirit of God is saying this. And they are totally polar opposite of one another. And you're saying, wait a minute. Who is actually listening to the one Spirit that should be operating in the one body? You know, I, I, I see a lot of times self-promotion taking place under the guise of the move of the Spirit. I see a lot of times of, of self-promotion and, and even, even man-made theology and man-made ways being promoted under the guise of the Spirit of God. I see a lot of emotional hype promoted under the guise of the Spirit of God. See, there's only one Spirit. One spirit in one body. And in order for that body to be everything that it needs to be, it must have the breath of God blowing and moving and operating so that that body can have life. Can I tell you, we could go through the motions here at Daystar and we could come together and we could operate and we can function and we can do all the things that we do to look like a church and act like a church and smell like a church. But I want to tell you something. I know the old adage is if it walks like a duck, sounds like a duck, talks like a duck, then it's got to be a duck. Just because it looks like acts like, smells like, talks like a church doesn't mean it's the church, doesn't mean it's the one body because if you don't have the spirit of God, if you don't have the moving of the presence of God in operation in the body then that body is nothing more than a gathering place, nothing more than a club I don't want to be a club, I want to be a moving, living, breathing entity that is moved upon by the spirit of the Holy Ghost that God would manifest his presence and his power, I don't want to be known as the club of Daystar, I want to be known as the body of Christ operating under the fullness of the power of God. you got to have that breath. you got to have that moving. Dead bones in a valley would just be dead bones except the wind blew. 
skin could come on those bones and sinews and tendons and things could have come together and they could have stood up and just looked good. But they weren't exceeding and they weren't great and they weren't even an army until the wind blew. Let me tell you what the wind to do. The wind to take mere fishermen and cause them to be apostles. The wind, the wind, oh man. The wind, the wind of God can blow. The, the, the Hebrew word is ruach, the, the wind of God. It can blow, it, and, and, and it can blow upon people who seem to be dead and bring them life again. It, it can blow on people that, that seem to be down and out and depressed and give them hope and joy again. The wind, the wind, the wind can blow on people and make such an impacting difference on their life. I'm telling you, the wind of God can blow and cause sickness to be dispelled, can cause cancer to fall off. The wind of God, let the wind of God blow, and the church would come alive again. We need the wind, we need the wind. We need the Spirit of God. We need His presence. We need His power. We need the breath of Almighty God once again. I don't want Joe Blow's wind. I don't want this, this guy's wind. I want the wind and the breath of Almighty God to blow again. Oh, my. The breath. The breath. We need the breath. And the breath comes when we prayerfully tarry. You know, we have become so busy and so preoccupied with what we think to be life while real life is just saying, I'm here, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I am life. If you'll come to me, I'll give you rest. If you come to me, I'll give you peace. If you come to me, I'll give you joy. If you come to me, I'll give you breath to breathe and life to live and I'll give you abundant life if you'll just come to me. But we get so preoccupied. And then we wonder why God doesn't move in our little 30-minute get-together on Sunday. We wonder why we don't feel God. And we wonder why we don't feel His presence when we go to spend our five minutes and go through our little ritual saying we did our prayer time on a, on a Monday or on a Wednesday or Tuesday, whatever. You know, all of a sudden we're sitting there and we're, we're saying, God, you feel so far away. Why? Why is it? God's not looking to be squeezed into your life. God's saying, listen, there's only one way. There's only one hope. There's only one calling. There's only one purpose. And it comes through being in one body with one spirit moving through you. It would be amazing to me if the body of Christ could ever really get together and understand the, the principle of one body and one spirit. And if we could all begin to operate in that way, oh, what changes we'd see in this world. You know, wouldn't it be something if everybody within the within the body of Christ that claims to be a part of the body of Christ. We get under this one spirit, and yet, listen, to the, ah, you know, I think about this. I think about it in the book of Acts where, 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 where some of the early disciples were standing before the Sanhedrin, and, and, and the statement was made, are not these the men that have turned the world upside down? I mean, just think about it. The multitudes of people that we got that claim to be a part of the body of Christ, if they could get this one body, one mind, one spirit kind of attitude, and we could say, you know what, let's just tear the signs down and just let people know we're the body of Christ. Let's just take the names off the marquee and put the name of Jesus out there. Let's get worried about what people say or people think and just do the works of God. Couldn't we be a people that could again, once again, turn the world upside down if we could get the spirit of God moving in the body of Christ and be what God, I'm telling you, we could do it again. For him, presidents would talk about us, governors would talk about us, foreign leaders would say, Listen, I don't know who these people are, but they move with such power and authority. They seem to be ignorant and unlearned people, but there's a power about them. That's what they said about the first church. How's it these unlearned and ignorant men seem to be speaking with such authority? You know, one of the greatest denials was the denial of Christ by Peter. And yet, even standing by the fire, people said, I perceive that you've been with him. <laughs> I mean, whew, wouldn't it be nice if people were perceived that we've been with him? That his spirit, his breath is in us. We live and move, and in him we have our being. So there's one body. There's one spirit. I, I'm trying my best to get through three verses tonight. But I'm telling you, I feel the presence of God in this house tonight. There can be no church without the spirit. And there can be no spirit without the receiving of with prayerful waiting, prayerful tarrying. So he said there's one body, there's one spirit. Just as you were called in one hope, there's one hope in your calling. 
You see, when you come together in one body and you're being motivated by one spirit and you're being moved upon and empowered by one spirit, then we've all got the same hope. In other words, I've got the same end in mind you've got in mind. Amen. That's good, preacher. I'm not just going through this thing to try to, try to get what I want. I'm trying to go after what he wants, and that's my hope. It's the hope of my calling. It's the hope of my purpose. It's the hope of my destiny. It's the reason why I live, I breathe. It's the reason why I exist. I'm here for one reason and one reason alone, and that's to fulfill the prophetic call of my life to be everything he's called me to be. And in order to do that, I've got to have hope at the end of this stuff. And there's only one hope. It's not a hope of bigger bank account, a nicer car. Listen, it, it, those are self-motivated hopes. Those, those are not even true hopes. But the hope that at the end of this thing, when everything seems to be ready to be wrapped up, and I've got the hope of hanging in there, if I hang in one body with one spirit, the hope, the singular hope that I've got is that I stand before him and he says, well done. That's the hope i got. That's the hope I'm longing for is that one day I'll hear him say, well done. We're all proceeding towards the same goal. This is the great secret of the unity of Christians. As Christians, we're all trying to get to a better place. And along the way, we're letting people understand the reasoning behind our journey. We're letting them know about this man Christ that can save from a multitude of sins, a blood that can wash you and make you new, that can release you and give you freedom and liberty. This is the hope of our calling. This is the method of our madness, if you will. This is the thing that unifies us. Our methods, our organization, even some of our beliefs may be different. There's some people that don't believe the way I believe. There's people that sit in this congregation that don't believe the way I believe. But yet we don't allow that to stop us from walking together in unity. You know, it's not about method. It's not about organization. It's not about beliefs. Listen, we're all striving towards the one goal of a world that is redeemed in Christ. You know, I, I, got, I got pastor friends who argue with me about evidence, initial evidence. I got people that will dispute with me and talk to me. But listen, are, are we trying to see people get saved? I got pastor friends that argue with me about tithing. We, we have discussions about it. But the bottom line is, are we trying to see people get saved? You know, there, there's, some, there's some, some, some things that I adhere to and hold to, and some of my friends don't, but I don't allow that to get between me and them. I don't look at them as a heretic or anything. I say, listen, are you preaching Christ? Are you preaching him crucified? You know, I don't want to have the mindset of, of James and John who told Jesus, this guy over here, he's, he's not with us. He, he, he's out doing his own thing. Jesus said, let him alone. If the gospel's being preached, if the gospel going forth, it's, it's well, it's all right. Listen, I've got a promise in the book that God's word will go forth and not return void. But when it goes forth, it will serve the purpose whereunto it will see it. That means if God wants to raise up a Catholic priest and him preach Jesus Christ and him crucified and the, and the gospel message gets out there, I believe that people can be saved under a Catholic priest ministering the gospel message and they can come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, now, some of you might say, well, I just don't believe that. But listen, God can use who he wants to use. <laughs> Woo. I think some of you pondered, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This don't sound right. Pentecostal preacher talking about Pentecostal. There's something wrong with this. There's a hope in my calling that at the end we can stand before him and him declare, well done. It's not about labels. It's not about tags. It's not about uh, what I identify with or what persuasion I am. I've got one persuasion. That's him. He's the persuader. He's the one that made me who I am. He's the one that's called me and destined me and purposed me. I've got this one hope in my calling, and it's all based on him. Again, our methods, our organization, even our beliefs may be different, but we're all striving towards the one goal of a world that is redeemed in Christ. So, there, so there's one body. There's one spirit. There's one hope. Number four, there's one Lord. There's one Lord. There's only one Lord. There's only one Lord. The nearest approach to a creed which the earliest church possessed was, was in one short sentence. But let's look at it in Philippians chapter 2. I want you to look at verse 10 and 11. This is what Paul's declaring. He said, At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And look what he says here. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's only one Lord. It ain't Muhammad. It ain't Allah. 
is Jesus Christ. If you're Spanish, Jesus Christos. If, 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 you like the, uh, if you like Hebrew, it's yes, you are. I, I, I mean, I, we can stand up here all day and identify him by all these different names, but it's Jesus, he's the only Lord. People might call him all these different names, but it boils down to one person, the, 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 the God incarnate, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, hanging on a cross, bleeding for your salvation, brought down from that cross, put in a tomb, resurrected on the third day, arose and seated at the right hand of the Father, interceded for you and I, coming back again just like he said he would to take us that where he is, there we may be also. This is the one Lord. He is Jesus Christ. It is nobody else. It is not just God. It's not just this. It's not just that. It's not Allah. It's not Buddha. It's not. It's Jesus Christ. He is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life. There is no other life but by Him. He is one Lord. One Lord. As Paul saw it, it was God's dream that there should come a day when everyone would make this confession. Jesus Christ is Lord. The word used for Lord is curios. It, 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 it has two uses in, in, in ordinary Greek, and it shows something what Paul meant. It was, number one, it was used for master, as distinct from servant or slave, master. And it was the regular way of referring to the Roman emperor or the king. So Christians are joined together. When we declare that he is Lord, we are declaring him as master and as king. Master, think about that. I mean, a, a, as a master... Let me put it in today's terminology. As a boss, as someone who's in charge, they have the final say-so. You know, I, I have people that report to me every day. And when those people report to me, I give them their marching orders, if you will. I tell them, this is what you got to do today. They don't buck it. They don't, they don't argue with me. They say, okay, I'll get it done. Because they know that all I got to do is make one phone call, and they don't have a job. I mean, it's the bottom line. I, 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 I'm, not, I, I'm not saying that pridefully. It just comes with the position. And so in a sense, I'm the boss. I'm the master of that, 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 that group of people that I have been entrusted to watch over. But I don't lord over them and abuse them because that's not my nature. I try to think the best for them. And when they do good jobs, I make sure that they get rewarded for that. Well, you think about that from the concept of, of a master. If God or Christ is master of your situation, and he's saying to you, I I'm giving you your marching orders for the day, and you carry them out, and all you do is don't argue with him, don't debate with him, don't come present to him a better way. Just hear what he's saying. And do it. When you carry it out, I promise you, there's blessings at the end of it. These guys, when they work for me, at, at the end of the week, they get a check. And they get a good check. And they're thankful for what they get because they show back up the next week to do it all over again. But this is the beauty of the relationship with God. See, the check that I see that they get, within a matter of days, is gone. The, the blessings that God gives, <laughs> Woo. they are eternal. See, we're not storing up treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and the thief breaks in and steals, but we're storing up our treasures in heaven where moth can't touch them, rust can't touch them, thieves can't take them. I'm talking about eternal blessings of God because of what God has done through the one Lord moving with the one spirit in the one body with the one hope of our calling. It is one Lord. Not only is it master, but he's also king. And one, one gospel writer put it this way. He's not just king. He's king of all kings. In other words, kings still answer to him. Paul said, at the, at, the, at the sound of his name, every knee is going to bow. Every knee. That means Obama's knee. That means Sheikh Muhammad's knee. I don't know who that is, but I'm just throwing a name out there. That means, that means every, every uh, 
Iranian and Israeli and, and, uh, and Iraqi and Saudi Arabian. and I don't care how much oil or how much wealth they got. Their knees going to bow one day and they are going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now they might have proclaimed a lot of other kings. They might have proclaimed a lot of other masters. But there's going to come a day ultimately that at the final say so, every knee is going to bow and they are going to herald Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, I want you to understand something. What I want to happen for me, now you can speak for yourself, but what I want to have happen for me is that I want to practice now and know that I am in good standing so that when I get before him on that day, it's not going to be a chore. It's not going to be an embarrassment. It's not going to be something I'm going to regret, but it's going to be a joy to cast my crown at his feet and declare Jesus Christ is Lord. He is king and he's king of all kings. He is Lord and and he's Lord of all lords. I am looking forward to that day, not with embarrassment, not with indignation, but because I've fallen in love with him and obedient to his command, I'll get to one day take the crown of glory and cast it at his feet and declare him once and for all, Jesus Christ is Lord. This is the beauty, is that it's not master-slave relationship. It's not master Ray, slave relationship, and I'm going to get ahead of myself. We'll get to that in just a moment, but, 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 but it's king. It's master. It's king. So Christians are joined together because they are all in the possession and in the service of one master, one king. Again, I want to remind you tonight I'm talking to you about the basis of unity. If we can come together with these three verses and we can pull it together and say, listen, there's one, one body, there's one spirit, there's one hope, there's one Lord. And he goes on to say, there's one faith. One faith. Listen, I want you to understand something. Paul is not using a word here for creed. You know, have you ever been asked, what faith are you? They're asking you what creed you are. Or what persuasion you are. Or what do you believe. But Paul's not talking about a creed. The word that he's using here, faith, very seldom indeed in the New Testament does the word faith mean creed. By faith, the New Testament nearly always means a complete commitment of Christians to Christ. When I walk in faith and not by sight, when I walk in faith, I'm walking in total surrender, total commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things. It means I'm walking in surrender. I, I don't know what's coming. I don't know how it's coming. I, I, I can't even feel it. I'm, it's not tangible, but I believe it because he said it. That's faith. It's the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. It's saying, listen, I, my, my, my walk of faith is not based upon uh, something that's in a book somewhere. It's not in some theological book that some doctor put together. It's not in some, my faith is simply resting on the fact that Jesus said it, and that's good enough for me. Jesus declared it, and that's what I'm going to live. Jesus put it forth and I'm going to walk that out loud. I am totally and totally committed to the things of Jesus Christ. Paul means that all Christians are bound together because they have made a common act of complete surrender to the love of Jesus Christ. They may describe that act of surrender in different terms, but however they described it, that surrender is the one thing that is common to all of them. I mean, you might say, praise God, I'm saved, and Jesus washed me, and I've been made clean. Or you might be like the old folk, I'm saved and sanctified. Or you might go a little bit old school, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And then you might go a little bit old school, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and fire. But the bottom line is, none of that means anything if you don't know Him. It's one faith. It's one surrender. I'm not surrendering to a denominational teaching. I'm surrendering to him. Let me tell you something. Denominational teaching is secondary to the words of Christ. Do you hear me? I, 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 I mean, it is secondary to the words of Christ. And there are denominations out there that will teach you all kinds of things. And they'll lead you in all kinds of directions. But I'm going to tell you something. You better fall back in line with the words of Christ. I, 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 I've seen and heard and 
People have talked to me about different things, and, and, and I'll go back to them, and they'll say, well, well, this said that, or this person said this, and all of a sudden, I say, but, but what does Jesus say? Let, let's talk about that. You know, I, I've had people sit down with me and start arguing about theological things, and, and all of a sudden they say, well, well, this preacher said this or this prophet said that. And I said, let's look at what Jesus said. I've even had a look at me and said, well, let's look at it this way. The prophet said this. Let's look at it this way. The preacher said this. Let's look at it. And I finally got tired of it in one conversation. I said, let's look at it this way. There's a way that seemeth right to man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. How about that way? You can, you can try to parse it. You can try to figure it out. You can try to lock it down. But ultimately, you're going to stand before God and you're going to give an account by what faith you live if you live completely and totally surrendered to Christ that's what it boils down to I don't, I don't care if you color it this way, paint it that way do, listen, when you get to the root of it, if it is not founded on the Lord Jesus Christ you shouldn't have anything to do with it okay y'all are with me tonight, glory to God so, 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 so the, the common theme of it all it's complete surrender, faith. No, number six, one baptism. One baptism. In, in the early church, baptism was usually adult baptism because men and women, they were coming directly in from the worship of other gods into the Christian faith. And so, above all, baptism was a public confession of faith. And we, we baptize folks here. It is a public confession to say, listen, there's only one way for, for, for a Roman soldier to join the army. He had to take an oath that he would be true forever to his emperor. When, when, when people sign up for our military in America, they, they, they pledge their allegiance to, to the Constitution, to defend it, to, to, to work under the commander-in-chief. That, that's the only way they can get in. When, when, when people come here and want to join this country, they, they, they stand before a, a body, a legislative body, whatever, and, and they have to make a decree. I, I am here in total commitment, and I'm going to adhere to the laws and, and stay bound to the Constitution of this country. I mean, they go through this whole uh, uh, routine where, where they're declaring that, that this, is, this is what I am committed to. Baptism is not just you getting wet. It is a public statement that I am identifying with the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and I am committing myself totally, surrendered to his purpose and to his call and I'm letting all those that are in attendance and I'm allowing anybody else that would ask me what baptism, there is one baptism, it is an identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as it comes to baptism, some of you may feel one way or another. You know, I've had people tell me, you know, you need to baptize in the name of Jesus only or you need, you need to use the, you know, the, the one that Jesus talked about at the end of Matthew, you know, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know, listen, I, I, the bottom line is not what some preacher says standing outside the baptismal pool. The bottom line is, is your heart where it needs to be. Listen, I baptize them in the river. I baptize them in pools. I baptize them in, 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 uh, 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 in, in, the, the thing that we use here, I mean, it doesn't matter to me. It's just, it's just a, a, a symbol of your confession of faith. You know, the, 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 the eunuch in, in, in uh, Acts chapter 5, 6, somewhere on there, Philip, uh, Philip runs into him, and he said, what, what's, what's constraining me from being baptized? He said, hey, oh, we need some water. They turn around in the middle of a desert, and there's a pool of water. Tell me that ain't a God thing. He says, listen, I want to identify that, that I, am, I am recognizing the call of God on my life to come and surrender my life to Jesus Christ, and I just want to identify with that. And it baptized him right there. And the Spirit of God gave confirmation of the baptism and what Philip had done by the Spirit of God picking him up and taking him to his Otis. Wow. It was one baptism. It was one baptism. So when people begin to understand one Lord, one faith, one baptism, there has to be a total adherence to what God is saying and what God is declaring over our lives and following those principles. Listen, listen I'm going to get through this thing. Let's go to the next verse. Verse 6. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. One God. There's one God. This is, this is what he says. Now, Paul takes this when he breaks it down, okay? And we're going to go through the breakdown here. Number one, Paul says about the God in whom we believe. Number one, he said he is father of all. He is father of all. In that phrase is enshrined the love of God. God so loved the world that he gave. He's father of all. God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to everlasting life. He is father of all. The greatest thing about the Christian God is not that he is a king, not that he is a judge, but he is father. 
He's not some dead, lifeless God sitting on a shelf somewhere. He's not somebody that's out distant and don't have any concern about it. He is Father. Listen, I am I am of, of the utmost concern as a dad what's going on in my kids' lives. My dad calls me on a regular basis just to see if I'm doing all right, if I need anything, if there's anything here. Why? Because as a dad, it doesn't matter if his son's almost 42 years old, he is still a dad and loves his son and is, and is in, in, involved in his son's life. Listen, even the more so do I feel and sense the presence of my father with me, letting me know on a daily basis, I'm concerned with where you're at. I'm watching over you. I am protecting you. Why? because I love you. He is Father of all. The Christian idea of God begins in love. Listen, what, what, why would you serve him if you didn't feel like he loved you? What would be the benefit? He's Father of all. And he says he is above all. He is above all. He's Father of all. He's above all. In that phrase is enshrined the control of God. He's above all. No matter what things may look like, God is in control. About five of you should have jumped out and ruined right there. I'm telling you. God is in control. He is Father. He is above all. I'll do the cliche. Whatever is over your head is still under his feet. I'm telling you, God is in control. Listen, you might feel like there, there's floods going on in your life. Look what, look what Psalm 9, 29 and 10 says. It, the, the Bible says that the Lord sits enthroned. The Lord has sat enthroned over the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. He is above all. The old song says above all powers, above all wealth, above all these other things. He is still God. He is God who is, who is in all. He is God who is above all. And the Bible goes on and says that he is God who is through all. In that phrase is enshrined the providence of God. God did not create the world and set it going as we might wind up a clockwork toy and leave it, run, leave it to run down. God is through his world guiding, sustaining, and loving. In other words, it goes back to the control of God. God is, is sovereign over your situation. God is sovereign over what's going on in your life. Let me tell you, let me put it to you this way. There is absolutely nothing that has come into your life that has caught God by surprise. He knows what's going on. Sovereign. I, I, I like to think about the sovereignty of God. Because I can just imagine God in heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. And looking down at our lives, not bound by time, but is but it's orchestrating everything and anything that goes on in our life. You know, right now, God is so sovereign that he's looking at my birth some almost 42 years ago in a couple of weeks, particularly at my present, and looking at my end on the end of his life. He is sovereign. He's saying, I got this thing, Joy. Don't you worry about that. I know that thing right there seems like a hiccup to you, but that's nothing to me. I know that thing's tripped you up a time or two, but you just keep going. Keep pressing on. It's going to be all right. I'm going to see you through this, man. I got you. Whoa, whoa, go that way over there. I got you, son. It is the drawing of the Spirit of God. We talked about that, son. God's, God's working on us. God's moving us. God's, God, if I can use it this way, God is manipulating our, our, our destiny. He's working for our good and making all this work out. You, you think this thing over here was a failure. But God said it was just a launching point. I'm able to take that thing and make it a testimony for you. I'm going to show you the goodness and grace of my mercy and what I'm able to do for you if you'll just trust me. It is the sovereignty of God. You mean God's working all this out for me? Absolutely. You mean this bad day was for my good? Absolutely. You mean this shortcoming was for me? Yes, it was. God's working on it. Don't you think God said, oh, I didn't see that coming. Yes, he absolutely saw it coming. God didn't walk around the corner and get surprised. He's already seeing around the corner before he gets to the corner. Matter of fact, he was looking at the corner before the corner was created. Woo, my Lord. God was already working on it. <laughs> and he's working it for your good. He's going God and Father of all who is above all and through all. And the final one is he is in all. In that, in that phrase is enshrined the presence of God. In every life. See, it, it may be that Paul took this idea from the Stoics. Let me share this with you. The Stoics believed that God was a fire, purer than any earthly fire. And they believed that what gave human beings life was that a spark of that fire, which was, which was God, came and dwelt in their bodies. That's the way the Stoics believed. So it was Paul's belief that in everything, God. The Bible says, in the beginning, God. He created the heavens and the earth. 
God. God was involved. God was involved in every aspect. Come and let us make man in our image. Let us create man. Let us, let us, let us form these things. Let us speak and there's light. Let us speak and the heavens and the firmament separate. Let us speak, speak and, the, and the waters and the land separate. Let us speak and those waters be filled with fish and the air be filled with birds. Let us speak and all these creeping things begin. Let us, let us speak and all of a sudden these animals will come. Let us speak. Let us come down now. Let us go down and make and create man in our own image. Let me take this dirt ball here and form it up and work on it. And now let me breathe the breath of life. Because if this body's going to function, it's got to have breath. I'm going to breathe the breath of life. And God said, I am putting me in you. You are a place of habitation for the presence of God. As that song says, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Why? Because God wants to be in you. And there should be a desire in every one of you to say, God, be in me. God be in me. I talked to God today. I came over today and got by myself and prayed a little while. I said, Lord, all I want is you. I don't want anything else. I just want you. I don't need anything. I just need you. And God, I know there's things in my life that are probably not pleasing you. And God, I want you to, I want you to take your spirit. I want you just to mortify those things in my life so that more of you can come in. I, I want to make room for more of him. I want to get stuff out. I want to liquidate stuff out. I want to, I want to obliterate stuff out of my life so that I can say to God, come on in. There's room for more because I want more of him because his desire is not just to be God who is of all or above all or through all. He wants to be in you all. The old hymn said, he abides, he abides. Hallelujah, he abides within me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way. For the comforter abides in me. Boy, I'm so thankful he abides. I'm so thankful that he's here. I'm so thankful that he's near. And I'm so thankful that he's within me and within you tonight. Aren't you thankful for that tonight? Listen, what, what everything that I've talked about is the Paul's belief that everything in everything there is God. It is the Christian belief that we live in a God-created, God-controlled, God-sustained God-filled world. Don't, don't allow the fear of the presence of evil to cause you to fear the lack of the presence of God. God is still at work. For where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. And boy, do we have sin abounding. But grace is still at work. There's still a hope. The sinfulness of the world is not the end of all things. He has the final say so. And the sinful in this world, if they will turn to him, if they can see a church, if they can see a body operating in one faith, one baptism, one hope, one breath, one spirit, one God, one Father of all, in all, through all, above all, in listen, that's what he, they need to see. And then they can begin to see the, the basis, the foundation of our unity that we lock together. Now, I could have I could have I could have gone ten thousand different ways with this tonight. But I'll tell you something. The church is at its most effective place when the church stands together. You 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 try to be a solo artist, there's only so much you can do. But there is exponential growth when the body of Christ comes together. One could put a thousand, two could put ten thousand. Well, preacher, that, 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 that don't make sense in math. Yes, it does if you understand exponents. God doesn't, God doesn't add. He multiplies. Come on now. God multiplies. And he does it exponentially. You know, you give one, he gives a hundred. He works exponentially. You know, you, you, you give what little you got, and God says, I can bless you. And I'm not talking about money giving. That's just a small part of it. I'm talking about giving of yourselves and say, God, all that I am and all that I ever be, I give myself to you. I live in total surrender, and I'm asking you to be the Lord of my life. Now, I, I, I'm going to close with this, and we're going to pray. We're going to pray. But this is what I want us to pray. And I'm not, I, I don't care. Right now, I really don't care where you think you stand or what position you think you hold or where you feel like you are spiritually, you might feel like you're on the mountaintop and everybody's 
Uh, you know, all your sins are washed, and you're just the best thing God ever created. You might feel that way. Set that pride aside right now because you got something to talk about. Amen? Right now in this moment, I want us just to take a moment right where you're at, or if you want to come kneel, that's fine too. But right where you're at, I just want you to say, God, this body cannot operate in the way it needs to if it is fragmented from the head. And the world is doing its best to try to cut off my connection. I'm talking about you as an individual. If, the indivi- if you as an individual, if the world and, and life and, and what we think to be life and chaos and noise and all this stuff that we have to deal with on a daily basis can get us disconnected from the head, we become null and void because he's our source. And if we can ever get connected with him as individuals, watch out, world, because when we come together corporately and we're all connected with him, it is a power that is greater than any atomic or nuclear bomb this world could ever produce. Amen. Brother John and I were riding down the road the other day, and he was talking to me about the, the power in a pound of water. He was talking about how that, that water can produce so much energy, just a pound of water. And I think you told me a gallon was eight point something pounds a gallon of water was. So you think about, you take the eight, uh, eighth part of a, a gallon of water, and, and that pound of water can, can, can cause such a, 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 an atomic blast it, it, that it could blow a hole in the wall. I mean, it, it, it could destroy things. It's like a pound of dynamite, a gallon of, uh, an eighth of a gallon of water. You think about that for a moment. And, and yet, God has put something so powerful in you and wants to abide within you in such power. When the body of Christ can come together, it would be greater than any force this world, by its man-made means, could ever produce. That it could ever produce. And God is saying, if you'll just come together, this world will see a movement like it's never seen before. Now, to tie all this together, there is a move of God that's coming in this last day. There is an outpouring that's going to transpire, going to take place. And there is a remnant of people that are beyond titles and beyond labels and beyond identification with this, that. They are just identified with one thing, I am Christ. He is and he is alone. And the move of God's presence is going to transpire. The Bible said that all that call upon the name of the Lord in that last day shall be saved. It's coming. It's been prophesied. It's spoken by prophet Joel. It was spoken and reiterated by the prophet uh, 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 Peter as an apostle. God, God's going to fulfill that word. All that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to be a part of that powerful move of God, don't you? I, I don't want it to be. Listen, Azusa is history. And that's all you see about Azusa is in history books. Cane Ridge, Kentucky is in history books. I, I, the the, 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 the Shearer Schoolhouse is in the history books. And, I, and we could go through and talk about all these, the Welsh Revival, Jonathan Edwards, all these, all these guys. We could talk about all their movements, but they're in the history books. But there is coming a sustaining move of God as prophesied in the Word of God that's going to sweep the world in the last day. According to the Word of God, in the last day, there is a sustainable move of God that's going to bring the fulfillment of the return of Christ to call His children home. Amen. And that's the part of the movement I want to be a part of. Amen. That's the part. But i got to know that I am connected Not only with him, but I am connected into the body of Christ because I can do nothing in and of myself. That's the kind of unity God's looking for. That's the kind of surrender, commitment that God's looking for from you and me. So tonight, I want us to pray for just a moment. Trace, if you want to play us something soft, that'd be fine. I want us to take a moment. I want us to go to a place of total surrender and tell God, Lord, I'm not arguing about what I did from this point back, but from this point forward, I want you to be master. I want you to be king. I want you to be sovereign over me. I want to understand one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I want to understand one hope, one one body, one spirit. I want to understand that you are one God, Father, in all, of all, through all, by all, whatever alls you want to put in there, I want God to be that in your life, yours and mine. Amen? Amen. Can we find a place of prayer? If it's your seat, the altar, I don't care. And just surrender, leave in total surrender to God tonight.
It's the joy of being loved.